So our next presenter is Eric Weldy. He's a fourth year medical student at the University of Tennessee, and he's presenting on proptosis and insidious vision loss in a pediatric patient, if, if you need a mouth. Sure, thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? Okay, um, so I'm gonna jump right to it. So the patient was a seven-year-old female initially presenting to an optometrist uh, for annual screening exam, and there she was noted to have significant vision loss. On further questioning, um, the patient was not aware of this vision loss, but denied any pain, uh, also denied any other systemic symptoms like headache. Her past medical history was essentially negative. And on examination, uh, the patient was 20-20, counting fingers at four feet. Previously, she had been 20-20 uh, about a year ago at her prior um, screening examination. She did have an RAPD in that left eye. Pressures were normal, motility was intact. Slit lip exam was normal, and I'll discuss her dilated fundus exam on the next slide here. And as you can imagine, given that she was counting fingers at four feet, she had poor stereo, she couldn't perform the color plate very well in that left eye, and additionally, she was a little bit proptotic with a difference of three between the right and the left eye. And so here's the DFE, which I want to spend a little bit of time discussing. You can notice starting with the normal eye, the right eye, there's normal color here at the disc, normal caliber of vessels. Now compare that with the left eye. Immediately what sticks out is that there's pallor throughout the disc, no edema, somewhat normal caliber of vessels and no macular uh, edema as well. Given the pallor, which was suggestive of optic atrophy, um, some more imaging was done and an RNFL was obtained, which showed diffuse thinning throughout all quadrants of that left eye. Additionally, a visual field was done. Initially, it was automated at first, but there's total depression in the central 24 degrees of vision. As a result, a Humphreys was performed, or a Goldmans was performed. And you can see here, so this is the left eye, I don't have the image of the right eye, but in the left eye, you notice a paracentral island of vision remaining tempori temporally. So what would be our differential diagnosis? Just to review, we have painless vision loss. We have proptosis in a pediatric patient. We have the optic atrophy. We have that temporal island of vision. So by far and away, compressive is the first thing top of that differential. I listed others here just for the sake of completion, um, but compressive, especially with the presence of proptosis, is the most likely. And what exactly is compressing on the optic nerve? And again, most likely it would be tumor here. We have no other reason to believe, based off of the signs and symptoms, there'd be any kind of thyroid disease in a pediatric patient, orbital cellulitis, or hemorrhage. So given that there was a suspicion of tumor, imaging was obtained, and this I could not obtain the image from the large uh, pediatric cancer hospital in Memphis, um, but I did get the readout, which showed a retrobulbar interconal mass lesion. And before I give it away, I just want to show um, there's a long laundry list of all the interconal masses uh, that you can see here. And for the sake of time, I won't go through all those. Um, but on MRI, um, you can see an example here, which I included. And here are some key buzzwords, uh, fusiform enlargement, homogeneous, well circumscribed, as if contained by dura, and iso intense compared to the gray matter. And all of this is consistent with an optic nerve glioma, which is what the radiologist called it as. And so now I want to shift gears a little bit and just give a brief overview of optic nerve gliomas, and more generally optic pathway gliomas. So it is a tumor of glial cells, which support the neurons that help form the blood-brain barrier, as well as assist with metabolic needs. And the most commonly involved cell are astrocytes. They get their name because they look kind of like stars. They have these long star-like processes. And one interesting thing is I was as I was reviewing the literature and reading a couple book chapters, um, is that I noticed there seemed to be kind of a controversy as to whether these are neoplastic in nature or whether they're hematomatous in nature. And I myself am not sure which of the two camps they fall into. I read one article that said pretty definitively, oh, they're neoplastic, no doubt. They're invasive, they're aggressive, they grow backwards sometimes, they're definitely neoplastic. And then I read this other article by the Ophthalm Ophthalmology Plastic Reconstructive Surgery Journal, which said they should definitely be called hamartomatous because they're quiescent, they don't invade. So I'm not sure which of the two camps they fall into. Maybe it could be a spectrum. Um, but of course, your identification could spill over into your treatment. If, if you think it's more neoplastic in nature, you might treat it more aggressively. And of course, there is that strong association with NF1, which is seen in 60% of cases. Overall, it's a pretty rare tumor, three to four per 100,000 patients, and it's diagnosed at a median age of 6.5 years in NF1 patients. In sporadic patients, it's a little bit older, it's about eight years old, but I thought that this uh, graph here was really interesting. 
So this is the age, uh, so this, these are all NF1 patients in this study. And this is the age at which NF1 patients were diagnosed with an optic pathway glioma. And you'll notice that the vast majority are diagnosed before eight years of age. There's a couple outliers here diagnosed 10 years and older. Um, but the interesting thing is based off of this graph, um, the recommendations fit. So patients need to get comprehensive eye exams um, eight years and younger if they have NF1. Beyond that, they can go every other year. That is a soft recommendation, though, and not a hard recommendation. Um, currently, there's no required recommendation to do screening MRIs of all NF1 patients, however. And the pathophysiology is interesting. So there's two camps to mentally organize these into those who develop optic pathway gliomas in NF1 and those with sporadic tumors. And both share this common pathway. So I like to think of neurofibroma almost like retinoblastoma. It's a tumor suppressor gene, and you inherit one bad copy, so it's autosomal dominant. And then over time, that other bad copy gets knocked out, which releases the breaks on this proliferative process. Whereas in the sporadic case, you get some kind of alternate RAS activating pathway outside of the neurofibrin tumor suppressor. But both use this RAS, RAF pathway, which maybe in the future that could be some kind of molecular target that we could use. And so our patient, she only had one cafe LA spot, so she didn't meet the criteria for neurofibromatosis and was deemed a sporadic case. So why is it so important to separate these two camps out into NF versus sporadic, uh, looking for things like leash nodules and plexiform neurofibroma? Well, it's because NF1 does have a better prognosis compared to sporadic cases. It's more interior, it's less aggressive, and as high as 50% are asymptomatic. And you see here, I constructed this kind of silly little chart here based off of um, the incidence and location of tumors seen in NF1 versus non-NF1. And you'll notice, like I said earlier, the NF tumors are more anterior, and sometimes they kind of spill over from one segment into the next, hence it doesn't add up to 100. But the non-NF are more posterior, and of course, as you involve the hypothalamus, you're going to expect uh, poor outcomes overall. The clinical features are in line with what you'd expect uh, with an optic neuropathy. Decreased colored vision, rarely painful, progressive vision loss. And I don't actually know how common this is, but I thought it was really cool. So, the enlarged optic nerve, based off the way you turn your eyes, sometimes it can get kinked, the blood supply can get kinked, and that leads to poor perfusion of the retina temporarily, which can lead to gaze-evoked vision loss. And the symptoms, or the physical exam findings, are in line with the location. So it, if it's an ocular location, you get proptosis, intracanalicular, pale optic disc, and as you go further back into cranial, you're gonna get raised ICP and precocious puberty. I just wanna point out, of course, you can get atrophy and ROPD like our patient, but this, I thought this finding was really interesting. So an enlarged optic nerve can actually press on the back of the eye, leading to refractive changes, specifically hyperopia, and you can also get retinal stri and optociliary collateral where you get poor uh, venous return. Diagnosis, thankfully, is now made by MRI, and you can look for these pathognomonic findings like kinking, you can look for pseudo-CSF sign. And luckily, uh, with the help of MRI, we don't need to take biopsies anymore, uh, which is great because it prevents further vision loss from biopsies, and you also have the incidence of false negatives. Prognosis, so like with most tumors, uh, younger patients tend to do more poorly. Uh, NF1, as I mentioned earlier, is a better prognosis, but otherwise it's very difficult to predict what these tumors are gonna do. There's a large variation in the rate that they grow, and it's hard to know uh, how these tumors are gonna behave other than that general rule of NF1 versus sporadic cases. So with that, since you don't really know how these tumors are going to behave, it's really hard to know when to treat these. And uh, actually, in, in talking with one of my oculoplastic attendings at my home institution, he said that about 30 years ago, every city had a different protocol for how they would treat these, these tumors with optic pathway gliomas. But as of recently, I believe it was 2007, Fisher did a large retrospective multi-center analysis and he came down to these two basic tenets of when treatment should begin. The first is functional loss, greater than two snell lines, and the second is radiographic growth. So it's, of course, taking these two principles together um, that can help you determine when to initiate chemo, radiation, and surgery. And of course, like I said, so many of these are asymptomatic, so it's hard. You definitely want to have a strict criteria of when to begin uh, therapy. Chemo has a pretty poor response, about 50% require further treatment, and uh, it might buy you some time, which is good because you don't want to irradiate 
uh, children given the risk of brain damage. Radiation is a little bit better. It does improve vision and uh, it does help with the five to 10 year survival, but there's all of these host of adverse effects. Um, particularly in NF1 patients, given their propensity to develop tumors, uh, irradiating them can predispose them to further neurologic malignancies. And there's an incidence of moya moya, which is that Japanese, which means puff of smoke. And finally, there's surgery, uh, which does result in irreversible permanent vision loss. And the three main tenets for this are if the patient is already blind, if there's severe proptosis causing cosmetic disfigurement or corneal exposure, and final lesions threatening the optic chiasm. But again, it's rare for these lesions to grow backwards into the optic chiasm. And so let's return back to our patient and see what therapy she received. So given the degree of her vision loss, she was started immediately on chemo over at St. Jude. And they treated her with MRIs, and uh, unfortunately her vision did worsen, and so she met the criteria for that significant decrease of vision as well as radiographic changes, and so they started her on radiation therapy. And they also trended her with scheduled MRIs frequently, and unfortunately, this is her actual MRI, and I know it's kind of hard to see, I apologize for that, but you can see she developed this new lesion right here, right at her chiasm that had never been there before, and furthermore, her proptosis was continuing to worsen. And so I actually spoke with the radiologist uh, about this lesion, and he said it, it might very well be just reactive changes. It could just be normal uh, tissue response to the tumor, or it could be some kind of tumorous appendage growing off of the optic nerve glioma, but most likely he thought it was reactive changes. And so neurosurgery and oculoplastics did come on board, and I actually got to see part of the procedure. Um, they put a suture under the superior rectus, and they pull it laterally to open up this window here between the medial and superior. And so you can imagine that the frontal nerve is at risk of damage here. And additionally, the trochlear nerve is at risk of damage here and all these little ciliary nerves which supply the cornea. I didn't really understand, I was asking my attending, why medial rather than lateral? And he pulled out this picture and he showed that with a medial approach, you can avoid these nerves here by pulling this laterally. And of course, obviously, you only want to remove cranial nerve two. And so theoretically, um, this medial approach allows better access without risk of damaging trochlear, the trochlear nerve. So this patient had a pretty rocky post-op course. She did develop neurotrophic keratopathy and developed numerous uh, corneal ulcers, was given a tarsorophy, but um, they reversed the tarsorophy per the patient's request, and she developed another significant corneal ulcer with corneal neovascularization. And finally, they decided to do Gunnarsson flap where they pulled the conge up over the cornea, and she's gonna be given a scleral shell. As I mentioned earlier, I'll just talk briefly about this. One of the hopes is that we can further specify uh, what type of tumors these are based off of the molecular diagnostics. And uh, so this is an example of M mTOR lighting up here. And hopefully we can also um, more specifically target these tumors. So those are my references. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Eric. That was a very good presentation. Um, I'll just ask anyone with questions to ask them directly there. Yeah. Uh,